Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is Inside the Mind of a Psychic. My guest is Christopher Robinson. He is co-author with Andy Boot of a book about himself called Dream Detective. He's the subject of the documentary Premonition Man, produced by John Beecher, who's been a guest on New Thinking Aloud. He's been featured in the book The G.O.D. Experiments by Professor Gary Schwartz of the University of Arizona. Various researchers and government officials have testified to the uncanny accuracy of Christopher's dreams in predicting dramatic events such as terrorist attacks. While his abilities have been tested in various laboratories, nothing yet has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. In this sense, he is similar to Ted Owens, the PK man, whom I studied and about whom I wrote a book. In fact, a book about Christopher Robinson is now in preparation by Grant and Jane Solomon to be titled The Premonition Man. In this interview, we will hear and see him tell his story going deeper into his experience, his inner experience, in his own words. Christopher lives in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Christopher. I'm happy to be with you once again. And I'm happy to be with you once again, too. Yes. In our previous interview, and I want to make sure that our viewers know about it, and if they haven't watched it, I'm going to link to it right now. It'll be on the, uh, if, for those who are not using an iPhone or uh, most people with a computer will be have a hot link right where I'm pointing in the upper right corner of the screen. I'm going to recommend that highly because we, we went into quite a bit of detail about how your career uh, began. We talked about, for example, uh, your early uh, UFO experiences and uh, some of the early work that you did with the law enforcement agencies, some of the work you did with uh, the noted psychologist in England, Keith Hearn. Uh, I, maybe a good starting point would be now, uh, many, many decades later, you've been at this work for some 40 years. Uh, do you have any reflections on uh, what an unusual life you've had? <laughs> It's certainly been an unusual life, that's for sure. Um, and um, sometimes I look back and I think of the amount of years that have been wasted because this subject was taboo to most people uh, and most media. I mean, it, 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 it you know... It's if we take the UFO part of this, I mean, I didn't, although there was an article in the newspaper for the first sighting at the time, uh, and the second one I saw on television, uh, I didn't tell people about those things because it was bad enough being able to see the future events uh, and get what appear to be messages from you know, dead police officers and dead relatives of people. And, you know, that was bad enough without going into the UFOs. But recently, of course, the UFO subject has been much more open. Uh, and I'm, I, I feel not so ashamed to talk about it. Um, and of course, my belief is um, very simple. There is a connection with some unexplained UFO type phenomena uh, and what we call the spirit world. I mean, I've got examples of that which blow, they even blow my socks off, never mind anybody that you tell them to. So, yeah, um, the, the wasted time 
that there's been on this planet because people have been unwilling to think outside the box. I mean, you know, a bit like your program, New Thinking Allowed. Well, New Thinking has not been allowed for years and years and centuries even. So there's been a lot of wasted time, but I'm hoping to catch up on that. Let's talk about the Lockerbie bombing case. I know that is one that we didn't discuss last time. And of course, it's not just a bombing. It was a bombing aboard, a, if I recall, a 747 jet aircraft that crashed in Lockerbie, Scotland. There's two parts to this. I'll do the main part first, uh, and then I'll introduce the spooky bit. Um, so it, it was... Um, the morning of, I think, the 21st of December, uh, 1988, uh, I had to be in London uh, to meet some police officers from Scotland Yard over something completely different, nothing to do with dreams, nothing to do with anything spiritual or psychic. Um, and when we met up, I felt brave enough to tell them a dream I'd had the night before. Uh, and I was worried about this dream. I, I mean, I was really worried. I've got to be honest. You know, it, it, it was very, very graphic, uh, very, very l lucid, if that's the right word. I mean, real. I was there in the dream watching these two terrorists. Uh, um, I'll just quickly say that often terrorists in my dreams start off as dogs uh, and the dogs can later merge or transform, I'm not sure the right word, into people in the dream uh, and then you understand much more about it. But m my key in is see a dog, think terrorist. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, these two terrorists were in a car driving from East London um, along the West Way, out towards Heathrow Airport. And I was kind of looking down on the car. Obviously, I could see through the roof of the car. It's, you know, dreams are like that. Things don't get in the way. Uh, and they were driving along, and they went to uh, an area and stopped their car, uh, which was near Heathrow Airport. Um, it was actually a place, I think, called Simpson. Uh, and I don't, I don't know whether these other two were already there or they were just arriving or when they got there. I can't remember exactly. But they met up with two other terrorists who were quite different from their terrorist organization. Uh, these were um, Middle Eastern terrorists. Uh, and these two... Um, Irish terrorists handed them a device uh, and they then drove back towards London. Now, in the dream, I kind of had an option, I think. Do I watch the two that had delivered the device or do I watch the two that had received the device? Uh, and I decided I'm going to watch the two that have now got this device uh, and we drove in to Heathrow Airport. Um, somehow they managed to get into a building that they shouldn't be in. Uh, and in this, this building stored, I don't know, if it was just luggage due to go on other flights. Um, but that's where my focus was. Uh, and they planted this thing that they just picked up from these other two in a suitcase. They... I saw them open a suitcase, put this thing in, close it, uh, and then the dream changed dramatically to a plane taking off, um, flying wherever it was going. I wasn't sure. Um, uh, and then I saw the plane explode. Uh, so that's the dream. Um, I decided that I wanted to tell these two uh, Scotland Yard guys the dream, and I told it to them 
pretty much, you know, it was a long time ago, exactly as I've just told it to you. Uh, and one of them looked at me and said, Christopher, what color was the plane? I said, that's easy. It was uh, white and blue 747. Uh, I said, and, you know, um, this is going to happen. And as far as I'm concerned, this is going to happen tonight. Uh, anyway, we talked about it a bit more. And I said, look, can, can, we, can we make a statement? Can I write this down? And they said the pitfalls of doing that would be if I signed a statement uh, and that got filed um, in wherever they file these things and something like this happened, maybe not tonight, but, you know, very soon, um, your life will change forever. Uh, have you considered the implications? And I said, I have. I've thought about that um, quite long and hard. Actually, I was thinking about it on my train journey into London uh, that morning. So we made a statement uh, and we discussed it further. Uh, and I can't remember which one of the two it was. They said, what do you think, Christopher, what do you think we can do about it? And I said, I don't know. I said, all I can do about it is tell you. Uh, my part of this has to stop there. Um, uh, and they said, well, we can't probably search all the 747s uh, that are white and blue. Uh, and I said, look, I, I don't expect you're going to be able to search any of them. I said, but if this dreadful thing does happen, maybe in future something much worse we can stop. Um, uh, and I suppose they could have, you know, if they'd have believed me enough, because uh, I certainly believed me enough, they could have, you know, done some kind of search of the luggage, um, stopped them taking off. But, you know, let's be realistic. You got some guy telling you about a dream. Yes, we know him. Yes, we've experienced really quite strange things before. But there hadn't been anything quite like this. Uh, so the plane took off uh, and just I don't know how long into the flight, uh, but just about seven o'clock. Um, it blew up and it killed everybody. Uh, and of course, I was back home by then. Uh, and the television had a, you know, a banner news flash across the screen and they cut in. I can't remember what program it was on, um, but they cut into the news flash uh, saying that a plane had gone missing off the radar screens. That was the first we were told a plane had gone missing off the radar screens over Scotland uh, and then dripped in uh, as, uh, you know, as more news came in. There was more news on, you know, about this explosion. Now, the next morning, and this is the spooky part. The next morning, there was pictures on the TV of the cockpit of the plane laying in a field. And the plane was made, I think, made of the seas. Uh, and that made me freeze. Whoa. Because you see. Back earlier in the year, I'd been flying in that plane to Seattle to change flights to Las Vegas to go to the National um, Exhibition of Broadcasters. Uh, and when I was in that plane, before we took off, so, I'm, so you've got to imagine, I'm with a whole group of journalists, uh, and most of them, uh, well, at least a dozen of them I knew, that were on that flight. Um, and I, I, I know I saw this like a flash under the floor of the seats in front of me. Uh, and I commented on that. Uh, I said, do you guys see like a, a flash go off? Is anybody taking flash pictures? Uh, and I called the stewardess over uh, and we're just getting ready to taxi so I, I don't know if we we hadn't started the main taxi, but we'd left the stand. 
And I said to her, you know, I've just seen like a big flash coming from the floor. <laughs> and she jokingly stamped on the floor and she said, I can assure you, nothing's coming through that floor. It's very sturdy, very, very sound, I think she said. Uh, and I thought, yeah, yeah, Im imagination. But that's really a bit spooky to me because, you know, how do you see things that early? How early was it? Well, that was the April, uh, the same year, 2008. Well, no, we were talking 1988, were, were we not? 1988, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know I was in Vegas for my birthday. So I know it was April because this was on the way out. I couldn't give you the date, but, you know, probably somebody really interested, they can look up, you know, what the, where the, what time the NAB was, you know, that year, I mean. The crash was in December. The crash was that night, December the 21st. 20 minutes after the plane had blown up, I got a phone call from a police officer. Uh, and it started off, Christopher, what have you done? And I said, I think I know what I've done. Um, he said, they want you at Scotland Yard at nine o'clock in the morning. And if you're not there, they're coming to get you. And the officer said, I've managed to talk them out of coming to get you tonight. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, yeah, I got there the next day and um, went up the back stairs, which was unusual. Normally you go up in an elevator. Uh, but these two officers took me up the back stairs. And as we were walking up the stairs, one of them looked at me and said, Christopher, you could be a security risk. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I guess I could. Uh, and the other one looked at me and said, but you could be an amazing security asset. Uh, and then you were taken into a room and met all sorts of people and, you know, got strip search going in <laughs> into the room. You know, I suppose they need to make sure I haven't got anything with me that I shouldn't have, I guess. Um, but so that's that story. And it, it my life changed forever that day. It, believe me. I mean, you know, people came from places that I didn't even know exist to talk to me uh, and as a result of that and other things early uh, in the next year a procedure was put in place where I had a separate phone line and I had a fax machine and anything that I dreamt like that uh, in fact it turned into anything I dreamt at all whatever I wrote down faxed it to a police station uh, and that went on I can't remember how long it went on uh, but it went on for a good couple of years. Uh, and there was so much stuff after that. I mean, just just incredible. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how much of this is in my book, Dream Detective, because I haven't read it <laughs> for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember what's in there. I'd need to read it again to remember how many of and what stories we told, uh, because, you know, we couldn't tell them all. Uh, and, of course, the book was 1996. There's been a whole lot more since then. So I guess it's fair to say that the, the Lockerbie bombing was the point at which the, the National Intelligence Services took you very seriously. They had to, didn't they? You can't go into a police station or, you know, anywhere, Scotland Yard, never mind, you know, just an ordinary police station. Uh, make some kind of a statement like that. Um, you know, the, it was Pan Am 103. The plane was white. The lettering was blue. You know, I mean, that wasn't wrong. You know, it, it didn't turn out to be a red one or a green one. You know, the color of the plane was right. Uh, and then, of course, when I realized, I think, hang on a minute, I remember this incident being in that same plane. Uh, and I managed to dig out a photograph I'd taken of it uh, when we were still, you know, in the departure lounge. So I know it was that plane, I, I, you know, and that, it's awful to say, but to me that was more spooky than the fact the plane blew up. You know, mm -hmm. terrorists are doing stuff like this all the time, um, and it's 
terrible. But to have seen something under the floor that early, that was, to me, something even different, something mm-hmm. more far out. You know, what was that about, you know? But, of course, since then, I've had even stranger things, let mm-hmm. me tell you. I think one of the uh, really significant things would be 9-11. I hear people who say to me all the time, if parapsychology is real and people can have precognitions, how come there weren't any psychics forecasting 9-11 before it happened? But you are the living contradiction of that skeptical claim. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. I mean... It depends. It depends how far we want to go back. Um, the first attack uh, in February 1993 on the World Trade Center, I actually had a film crew with me from New York, from the Discovery Channel. Uh, the producer was a lady called Sandra Martin, uh, and they spent uh, I don't know a a week or maybe 10 days, you know, not in my house every day. We went out and did things on location. But um, with me filming, uh, and I dreamt during the course of that filming um, of the Twin Towers coming down like a pack of cards. Uh, And I can't remember whether that was the day of the first bombing or whether it was a couple of days afterwards. Um, One thing is certain, I did not say to them, somebody's going to put a bomb in New York under those towers. I didn't know that. But as a result of the news of that happening, in in another dream, I drew them, I drew them like playing cards. You know, you stand them up and get higher and higher. Uh, And I drew that. Uh, and I drew that all falling down. Um, and, you know, I, I, I kind of held that in the back of my mind that at some point in the future, that's going to happen. Now, I, I'm, go- I'm going to be as honest as I can be. I think the first I dreamt of it again was very early in August. 1999 Uh, and those dreams continued through to the night before it happened Uh, and I had reported uh, some of those dreams to the authorities uh, in England during the the run-up to 9-11 so it was September the 11th but the whole the end of July and almost the whole of the August I was conducting experiments at the University of Arizona with Gary Schwartz, where we were testing dreams showing the future. Uh, And during, um, I think it was probably, I don't know if it was the last day, but I had a dream when he came to my hotel to, uh, how it worked is I would dream it, he would come to the hotel, we would photocopy the dream film the dreams film an interview with me and then he would phone someone who then phoned somebody else in california i think uh who would randomly or pick out an envelope to the place we had to go and the idea was that my dreams matched in some way the place that we were going that day uh, and didn't conflict with the previous places we'd visited um, so, for example, if I'd put down museum on any of the dreams, that would have ruined the experiment because we went to four different kinds of museum. What I had was the de- the specific, what it looks like when you get there, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and it was just, it was just mad because before he, before he even undid his briefcase, He said, what did you dream last night, Christopher? I said, I don't even want to tell you. In case telling you makes it happen. Uh, And he said, is it that bad? I said, yes. I did tell him. Um, But I said, you you know, we're not going to film this because, you know, 
at times during all of this, I've got to be honest, you start to think, did it happen because you dreamt it? If you hadn't dreamt it, it wouldn't have happened. If you hadn't said it, it wouldn't have happened. You know, did you kind of see it? Uh, and I had a, an example of this last month. A friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, had never had her house robbed. Uh, and I was helping her put her garden furniture in, in, in a storage shed. Uh, and when we finished, I said to her, I'm going to lock the gate. Don't lock the gate. It's too. It, so the gate went out to the street. Um, she said, it's too hard for me to get back in. Don't lock it. I never lock it. And I said, well, one day you're going to get robbed because if you don't lock that gate and somebody comes through it, and they close it behind them. They've got all day at the back of your house to do whatever they want. Four days later, somebody did and they forced their way in through the back of the house and stole everything she had. Now, I still think if I had kept my mouth shut, would that not, you know, wouldn't that have happened? Did I somehow, because I said it, and, I, you know, I might sound like a lunatic to all of you, but sometimes I think like that. Did it happen because... Well, was this a dream that led you to say that, or was it just a spontaneous intuition? It was just a spontaneous intuition. I hadn't dreamt it, but it just kind of came in my head to say it. And I'd never said, I mean, she, I don't know if she'll talk to me ever again, because she thinks that if you hadn't said that, nothing would have happened. Uh, and I'm, she might be right. I've often thought, you know, did it happen because dreaming it created it I, I don't know we don't know the answer to that do any of us know the answer to that I don't know well I can tell you as a parapsychologist we would think of this in terms of the relationship between precognition on the one hand and psychokinesis or mind over matter on the other and there are many examples uh, in which parapsychologists debate you know was this precognition or was it psychokinesis so it's it's really an open question yeah i mean you know i mean i wished i hadn't said anything because maybe yeah. and and i'm going to be honest i don't i'm not a parapsychologist i'm not a psychologist you know i'm just me <laughs> <laughs> yes it's it's something that sometimes i worry about well back to 911 I recall you you sent me uh, from your own dream diary. This was a dream, if I remember, about one year in advance. And you even drew a picture of the Twin Towers and said, uh, this is going to happen in New York. And you, you said, an airplane, an airplane's going to crash into a, a tall building in New York City. And there's the picture of the Twin Towers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was certain... You know, as I say, I'd held the idea from back from 1993. I'd held that idea that one day they're going to, you know, they are determined to bring those down. Uh, and then, you know, the bad guys. And, you know, it, it didn't happen uh, on that first, um, you know, I mean, that was a dreadful incident. People lost their lives in that. But it wasn't anything like bringing them down and killing thousands of people. You know, but yes, I, I, I was worried about that um, from time to time. It came back into my mind. And as I say, 1999 was the very first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I then reported it through intelligence contacts I had in London. Uh, and it came back to me that, Christopher, there is interest in what you're saying. Uh, and then one of the dreams particularly remember now, uh, I was actually in an aeroplane. Uh, I can tell you, I was in row five at the front of this plane uh, when the t hijackers came through the plane down to the cockpit. Uh, and, and I actually drew the row of seats. I haven't got the notes anymore, but I drew the row of seats. Uh, and when I spoke to my contact uh, in London, I, I think I sent it to him uh, and they talked about it even more and, you know, reassured me that, you know, we don't think you're nuts on this one. You know, this 
is something that there is interest in. Um, and then when um, when I got back from the United States, I didn't I didn't say anything. I think about what I'd been dreaming, but I wrote to um, the the special projects intelligence officer at the London Embassy, the US Embassy in London, and I sent. Um, uh, a letter saying that, that I'm, I need to talk to somebody about what I'm seeing. Um, and I sent two, maybe three um, DVD recordings of the Arizona experiments, hoping that somebody might just listen. Um, now, the, somebody did listen somewhere because between the time of the towers both being hit and them falling to the ground um, I received a phone call uh, and I'm standing in my kitchen looking through into the lounge at the television what's going on live uh, and the phone rang and my caller display unit which was on the wall it's just like a little LED uh, not LED liquid crystal display the number comes up on so it comes up with a number it comes up with withheld it comes up with unavailable and it can come up with international um and it came up with a row of zeros it was just the whole line of zeros uh and i looked at it and i was frightened to pick it up i'll be honest my wife said you're going to answer that i said no no i need time to think she said, you know who it is? I said, no, but I know who it is. So I knew who it was likely to be, but obviously not the individual person. Uh, and it rang again. Uh, and I, I wasn't, I'll be honest, I wasn't ready to talk to someone about it. I'm just watching this happen live. Uh, and I know I'm going to get, you know, what I say is going to be very important. Uh, and the third time I picked it up and the guy on the other end of the phone said to me, can I speak to Mr. I'm not very good at American accents. Can I speak to Mr. Robinson, please? And I said, I am speaking, sir. <laughs> uh, and he said to me, was I aware uh, of what's happening in New York as we speak? And I said, I got a bit indignant. I'm, I must have, he must have felt I was terribly rude. I said, are you aware that I've just come back from your country and I've been doing psychic experiments and I tried to warn people about this for the last two? I mean, I, he must have thought I was terribly rude, but I, I, I was just, is he indignant the right word? I was just annoyed, you know, because this, need, I, I felt it needn't have happened. You know, if we'd have, people had listened early on, you know, it's no good telling me you've got interest in it. Let's do something about it. Let's, you know, spend some time on it. Let, uh, uh, anyway, it happens. And I know Gary Schwartz uh, is on camera. I watched him testify that, that you had urged him to do something about it. You felt that this attack was imminent. I, 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 it was imminent. The, the notes that we made during the Arizona experiments. So so every night before the experiment, so the night before day one, I would write a question, what am I going to see tomorrow? And I would do that every night. Uh, and in two of those dreams, uh, I looked at them, I think I looked at them a couple of months ago. I, I haven't got the actual notes. They were left at the university, but I took pictures of them. They're not photocopies, they're just photographs I took of the pages. Uh, and in two of the dreams, there were dogs very near uh, where I was. Uh, and this terrorist attack uh, was kind of imminent. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the dream was, you know, I mean, I can tell you the dream. It was exactly what the fireman's video recorded. There's one plane where you're, there's one, sorry, there's one clip where you're standing in the street looking up at the towers when the plane comes in. That was exactly what I saw in the dream. Exactly.
So, and you're on record of having notified various intelligence agencies, particularly in England. Nobody's denied it. Nobody's denied it. Well, they, they could deny it, but then they'd be lying. <laughs> and nobody's lied about it. Yeah. Nobody. It's, Everybody it's, has said, yeah, he did tell us. So it's very, it's very clear that, that you were making every effort that you could make as a, as a citizen to, to try and uh, warn people about this particular attack. Y yes. Well, I mean, no, I, I mean, I could have gone to the embassy and protested and shouted and screamed and got arrested. And I could have done a lot more, you know, to make people listen. But you, 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 you turn up somewhere. And you're shouting this out. And unless people know who you are, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to get arrested for disturbing the peace or, you know, and you're quite right. You know, officials have said um, Tom Drake actually was in a coast to coast radio show uh, and he was um, an officer, um, an executive at the NSA. Uh, and I spent quite a lot of time with him doing other things after this. Uh, and and he was able to verify, you know, that um, the discs and the letter I'd sent to the embassy uh, did in fact arrive. But it didn't arrive in time for anyone to see it and take notice of it. Well, you got the phone call uh, actually while the attack was in progress. Yeah, while it was happening. Yeah, while it was happening. Yeah. So somebody knew something. And and this was a, a call from the United States to you. Yeah, it was at all zeros. And, and he said to me, I'm in an aircraft flying somewhere over the United States when he was talking to me. Uh, and we had quite a long conversation. He gave me a phone number to call uh, if I saw anything else. Um, he asked me, um, would I be prepared if it was deemed desirable uh, to come back to the United States uh, and do some experiments, some work, some. And, and I said, sir, I would love to come back. I would love to. And, and I did, you know. But so the, it wasn't just a very quick call. Um, I think the buildings fell while we were talking. Uh, so the call was probably 10 minutes long. Uh, and, I, and I said, yes, I'd be more than happy uh, once you've, you know, put things in place uh, to, to come back and meet people, talk to people. Uh, and of course, all that did happen. Um, it's, it's, you know, that's that, that all happened. Well, I gather that you did, in fact, uh, establish some connections then with, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Tom Drake of the National Security uh, Agency. He, he was just one person that I met, uh, but he was the person I liaised with from 2001 uh, to 2008. But I, I still talk to him now. I spoke to him the other day, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so we stayed in contact. Mm -hmm. um, but I was introduced to a lot of other people. I, we, I did a lot of experiments um, with somebody from where he worked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think I spent, well, 2002, I spent a month uh, plotting tomorrow. So working with somebody from there uh, what I what I was going to see tomorrow and while that was going on their Washington sniper uh, did what he did oh yes I recall and I was asked to look at that uh, and the witnesses as far as I remember said that they thought these assailants, criminals, whatever, I don't know the right word that you would use in America for them. Um, but they had a van. And my dream said they had a Caprice Classic. It turned out they had a Caprice Classic. And the lady that I was doing these experiments with was astounded. 
She said, what do you, I said, I don't even know what a Caprice classic is, but I was told that's what they had in the dream. Well, I think it's very interesting. On the one hand, the dreams come to you spontaneously, well in advance of certain major events. And then on the other hand, you've got researchers asking you, will you have a dream about where I'm going to take you tomorrow? Yes. But you see, that's a, that's my way of hopefully proving that this is really happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I mean, we did it with we did a whole series of experiments, uh, 89, 90, 91 with the police in London uh, and with the military intelligence. I mean, I mean, you can imagine somebody like me, they're not going to be interested in. No, they're going to be interested. They don't like the idea that you're going to talk about it. But of course, they're interested. You know, you can't tell these people things like this without them being interested in you. Mm. Uh, and my problem was I wanted – the reason that I didn't want publicity for me, I never really went after that, but my view was if there are more people out there like me who are afraid to speak up because of the debunking dodgy scientists who spend their whole life trying to say this isn't real, and, of course, when you know it's real, you get angry with these people. I hear them on the BBC saying there's no such thing as telepathy, there's no such thing as remote viewing. And, you know, I actually know there is. And I've spent over 30 years doing it. And it, it, it almost disgusts me that there are these groups of supposedly sceptical scientists. I mean, and some of the things they come out with, you know, I wonder why, I wonder why open-minded scientists don't challenge them. But they're afraid of losing their positions at the university. So they don't get challenged. So I kind of thought, you know what, I'll challenge you. So what I do, you go on television and say, put something in a box, bring it to the studio. I'll open it live on television. But before I open it, I'll tell you what's in there. And I did loads of those. I did loads of those, uh, and that got that got publicity. Hmm. You know, that got more people wanting to do a box, and you know, um, Let, and it isn't always not always right. Yeah. But I think I think I think there was only really one failure out of the thirty four or thirty three tries on TV. I mean, I, and it doesn't matter. What's interesting to me is it doesn't matter if you're doing it in a foreign country where they don't even speak English. You can still know what's in there. Well, it would be very interesting to to collect all the videos of, of those experiments. I've got four or five of them. Mm -hmm. um, one German show. One German show. There were four. Um, there were shows which you see they get shown and you, you they're they're somewhere else. You yeah. don't even see the show. Yeah. You know, you know that you got it right because you filmed it. Um, but um, I've got one. I've probably got about eight or nine of them, mm -hmm. you know, where um, there's, a, there's a German one, which is really good. Well, I know you're working currently with Grant and Jane Solomon to, to write a book about your life called The Premonition Man, and I'm sure they want to uh, collect all of those uh, examples of uh, media appearances and so on. I, I think they have already done that. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I mean, you, I'd need to ask them, but I, as far as I know, I've sent them copies of everything that I've got. Well, when the book comes out, it will be a very good resource for people. In the meantime, Chris, I'd like to ask you about the dream you told me about. Uh, apparently, it's, it's an old dream about the uh, World War Three. Yeah, I got it here. This is a copy of it. Um, it was when I was asking on behalf of our authorities, when and where is the next terrorist attack? 
uh, and I've said exact time and place, please. <laughs> and you never really got the exact time, but very often you got the exact place. Um, and I have symbols in the dreams. Dogs of the terrorists. Snow means it's happening very soon, uh, and it's really nasty. Lots of things. So I'm dreaming of a Russian. And I've got V stroke P1. Uh, and I'm dreaming of a radio and trying to tune in this Russian radio to this situation. And I've got very, very much deep snow. Christopher, ev the voice, everything is real. Underline. And then I've then the dream goes on. Um, I'm dreaming of England as well. And I'm dreaming of three rockets being fired at number 10 Downing Street from a van. I've got bomb to be dropped. Uh, did it go off? Did it hit the right house? Number 10. Well, three of them hit number 10 Downing Street. <laughs> but I wrote to the prime minister and we I warned everybody and... Uh, and it's really quite strange. Um, I didn't exactly know when it was going to be, um, but I knew that the terrorists had got a white transit van, a car hole in the top, and they put these four mortars in, uh, and three of them hit. Um, and that was... I can't see the date on the top of this copy that I've got, but I can tell you it was July... 1990 i think at the 6th and the 7th so the night of the 6th morning of the 7th so so we're talking about one dream 32 years ago it was clearly something to do a, a russian very terrible uh, and in my translation which i'll send you so what i would do is i would write the dream there and in the book so that would be the right hand facing page in the left hand, I would write what I thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And I've got World War Three question mark, Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I've got who is V stroke P1. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it could be Vladimir Putin, couldn't it? But now this is unlike 9-11 where you had repeated dreams. I, I gather you have not had repeated dreams concerning the Third World War. Oh, yes, I have. Uh -huh. um, but nothing like... Um, nothing simple like that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a Twitter account uh, and from well when when russia invaded crimea um i was in a i was either in an airplane fuselage which got shot down into the ocean or i was in a submarine that they sank i actually think they sank a submarine um but what can you do about World War Three? Not, not, not very much. But I have been putting on my Twitter lots of the warnings about different people, different countries, what's going on and what's likely uh, to happen. Um, but I haven't been, I haven't been keeping those dreams, um, the dreams that I would have had very early on. I destroyed them all. Um, it, it wasn't a moment of madness. Uh, I got so frustrated with um, no academics taking this seriously, just getting poo-pooed by the, you know, the band of skeptics who always put you down. The moment you say anything in the media, they leap out at you and say, oh, load of rubbish, all fraud, you know. So I got fed up with all that. Well, you, you were taken seriously, as we discussed last time, by Keith Hearn. Yes, Keith Hearn took it seriously. He spent, um, I don't know how long, 
but he used to come and stay with me in the mm. early in the early 90s uh, and he would sit up all night watching me dream and watching me write it down because yeah. he wanted to see me doing it uh, he didn't have a time lapse for camera or anything he actually wanted to sit there uh, you know and stay up and and watch it but i do recall there was a point at which you were so frustrated, you started to burn all your files. Yeah, I, I, I started to burn them all. My wife stopped me. Uh, and then sometime, I think 2015, I did burn them all. That was just seven years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I got rid of them all. In, in other words, what you're telling me is it's been an emotional roller coaster for you. Well, yeah, that's an understatement, <laughs> respectfully, yes. Yeah, because when you get people who do believe you, but because of religion or some other garbage that other people believe, they say, but we can't say this. It's not politically correct. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, 2000 and I don't know, it's 2005 or 2006, when the London Underground was bombed, I had the most extraordinary, vivid dream where I'm in the London Underground with the bombs going off. And at that time, I was liaising daily with uh, Tom Drake. Uh, and at that time, uh, the reason why I was liaising with him um, was because President Bush, I think he was in Scotland at some kind of conference or something, uh, and I was focusing on, did anything happen to him? You know, was the president in danger? Because I knew that I could talk to someone about that, uh, and I knew that if I saw anything, somebody would perhaps be able to do something. Um, and I didn't have anything about President Bush, but I had this whole story about the London Underground. Uh, and I was told the Commissioner of Police would rather see London destroyed than have to admit you're real. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to know. And they had the damn cheek when the bombs went off to say we didn't have a warning. They had a warning from Tom Drake and from me. But because of religion, I think he's a born again Christian or something. Not that I'm knocking born again Christians, but it, it was so against his belief that somebody like me could exist and warn about these things that not going to even think about investigating or putting any effort into it. Yeah. Honestly, it's outrageous. And it, it does get me angry. Yes, it does. Do you know about the Greek myth of Cassandra? I'm afraid I don't. Well, this is very relevant to your situation. Cassandra was given the gift of prophecy uh, but she was also given a curse by the gods that she would be a true prophet, but nobody would believe her. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of, it, it, well, it's not nobody believes me because yeah. I did get to people. Uh, and, and, but they couldn't get to people because, you see, in order to take action, you need to get to the right people. So if you get to somebody who's a police inspector, you've got to get past the chief superintendent to the military intelligence or somebody else. Yeah, it, it, there's always a chain that, that you have to go through. Um, and that's that's where it falls down. You know, that's where it falls down. doesn't matter how good you are. I mean, it, uh, this is not in any way meant to be conceited. But I've never met anybody that does it the way I do. I've never even heard of anybody that does it the way I do. Uh, and Gary Schwartz uh, and people that know confirm that to me. They say, beyond, he said it was beyond his imagination yeah. <laughs> in one of the interviews that you can see on YouTube with him. Uh, and 
that's what people have said to me. You know, very senior police officers have said to me, and they all say it in a very similar way. If what you're doing is real, and we know that it is, it means everything else we've been taught is wrong. Now, I disagree with that. Not everything they've been taught is wrong, but fundamentally, that might be true. Well, certainly to the extent that people have a belief system that this is impossible, that's wrong. Yeah. Oh, absolutely wrong. But, you you know, I mean, again, I, I'm, I, I'm not anti anybody other than terrorists, perhaps, and, you know, really, you know, I, I, I would never be for anything like their actions. But um, I, I, I just feel that people should be allowed to believe what they want to believe. But it ought to be private. It ought to religion ought to be personal. It didn't ought to come in to in the case of, you know, believing that, you know, you're from the devil. Uh, and I've heard from people, um, quite senior people in America, that that's been a problem they've that you've had there as well, where people, you know, believe it's demons telling us so we can't listen to it. And, you know, that's wrong. I feel only the truth is going to set us free from this. Yeah. You know, we've got to find the truth. We've got to establish beyond any. It's the same as the aliens. I've seen them. I know they are real. I've been in their ships in a dream. And I've even had a heart operation in a dream in a spacecraft. Now, the strangest thing about that dream is, number one, the heart was fixed. So the problem I had went away. But there were three puncture marks and you can see in there in my arm three like drill holes when I woke up in the morning and I went to my doctor and I showed him and he said what on earth have you done I said they weren't there when I went to bed he said where the hell did you sleep I said I was at home where there's no, no, you know, nothing, no drills, no sharp metal objects, nothing. You know, my wife was next to me. You know, there was nothing where I slept that could do that. I didn't tell him about the dream that went with it, but I did tell my cardiologist. Uh, and he said he's heard things like this before. He wasn't that surprised. When, now, when did this dream happen? Because I know we did, in our previous interview, talk about a, a different experience where you had a heart attack, but you were on a boat then. Yeah, no, that was, no, this one's, this one's uh, 2000 and, I don't know, 2015, 16? Recently. Quite recently, yeah, yeah. quite recently. And, and something happened twice. Uh, I, I, again, I'd need to get hold of my medical notes but I had torn my diaphragm uh, and I, I, I was carrying a lot of heavy boxes on my head and I felt something pull right in right here in, inside me uh, and I obviously went to the hospital and they did a scan and I saw this whatever kind of doctor deals with those things I don't know and his name was Dr. Jane I can tell you who he was uh, and he said to me, there's a small tear in your diaphragm. He said, and they don't heal by themselves. We will need to do surgery. He said, because your diaphragm is always moving uh, and it can't heal if we can't stitch it together because it, it never stays together long enough to, 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 to heal, which I kind of understood that. Uh, and they booked me in for this operation. And this is different to the heart one. Uh, this is probably 2003 maybe 2004, but not after then. Um, and uh, I've got a scheduled operation. Uh, and t I don't know, two or three weeks before that operation, uh, I'm dreaming again. That I'm up in a six, some kind of spacecraft. Uh, and these 
alien beings are operating on me. Uh, and I didn't think anything of it. It's just another one of these crazy dreams with aliens. Um, but when I, and this is where it really sort of, it upset the hospital and, and kind of made me think. Um, so I've turned up for my operation in the morning, seven o'clock. Haven't eaten anything the night before, haven't drunk anything other than water, ready to go. Uh, and it was about, it was probably 10, half past 10 maybe, that I I walked into the operating theatre because uh, they sit you outside in a waiting room to go in. I didn't need to be in a, you know, in a stretcher or a wheelchair or anything. Um, so I was in a gown, obviously, ready to go. Uh, and I walked in. Uh, and they said to me, can you get up on the table yourself? Uh, I said, yeah, I, I can get up there myself. So I get up there, I lay down. I'm never going to forget. He said, just before we put you to sleep, I'm going to do a scan and put a couple of little marks where I need to go in. Uh, and I said, yeah, whatever. Uh, so this Dr. Jane surgeon mr J I say mr jane i think um scanned m across my tummy uh and he did it again and he called somebody else over uh, and they did it and he then looked at me straight in the face i'm laying down on an operating table why didn't you tell us you've already had the operation and i said it's i said i haven't he said, I can see you've had the operation. And I said, no. He said, what hospital did you, I mean, I like interrogation now. What hospital did you go to? Because we all need the notes to make yours complete. But you should have told us. I said, I haven't had an operation. He said, you have. And I thought, well, I'm wasting my time arguing with you. I said, I promise you. I have not been to a hospital to have an operation. I thought I'm going to put the hospital bit in. And they sent me home. Uh, and they were quite annoyed that I'd wasted their time. Tell me what happened there. What happened? Well, you, did you have a dream then uh, prior? Yeah, well, uh, the, the, before, some weeks before, I dreamt that I was having the operation. But I just disregarded that. Yeah. You know, that's just a dream I'm having. You know, I'm going to be having an operation, aren't I? So maybe I'm seeing the operation that I'm going to have at the Luton and Dunstable Hospital. Uh, okay. And then another similar event in 2015. The other one was, my, was to do with my heart. I had these really, really constant pains. They didn't go away. You know, they were there all the time. And um, they did an angiogram uh, and they discovered in the angiogram that my aortic stem, if I get this right, I'm, I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I, I think the right coronary artery came off at right angles. So instead of coming off the, a, the, the, aorta, the aorta, I think is what where it comes from uh, and it sweeps round the heart because I'd had a heart operation when I was nine uh, and they'd stopped my heart uh, and they'd removed a co-optation in the aorta the a the stem was now shorter uh, and they wouldn't be able to get a catheter at right angles he said when we go in to do an ang angioplasty balloon thing he said we have to sweep in he said, we can't do a right angle turn. Um, uh, and there wasn't much he could do with it. Um, they gave me, what, I, can't, I can't remember now, uh, but I put up with these pains for a long time. Uh, and, I, and I rested and, you know, didn't. Uh, and the pains <clears throat> slowly um, became intermittent. Uh, I don't know why. Um, so from 2015, when I had that experience, um, to now 
the 27th or the 28th of April 2018 um, I'm back in this spaceship now the reason I was there is Dr. Hassoun who knows about my stories and read the Dream Detective book he said we can't do anything about that you know we can't get into the right coronary artery the worst the best we could do would be a bypass he said and we don't think you're going to survive the surgery for that we're not you know when we're, we're not ready to do that uh so we're not going to do what they call it cabbage or something i don't know um he said we 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 are not ready and prepared to to put you at risk for that and he said haven't you ever asked your friends to help <laughs> and i said no I said they've only ever helped when they've helped. I've never asked them for help. And he said to me, why don't you ask them for help? He said, because there's not much we can do. Now, I don't know what happened since then. I have had another lot of tests, but no results from them. And this, it was two days or three days before my birthday, 2018. I'm back in the ship. Uh, and they're saying to me, I got my arms strapped out as if I'm having an angiogram, looking out the window at the earth below. Uh, and they're saying to me, um, we've decided that, you know, we can help you a little bit more. Uh, and they, whatever they did, I don't know. Uh, and I woke up in the morning with terrible pains. Uh, and on the Monday, which probably would have been 28, Saturday 29 would have been my birthday on the Monday. My daughter and her husband had booked tickets to take me to Amsterdam for my birthday. Uh, and that's what we were going to do. Uh, but on the Saturday morning, I had so much. My daughter said, you can't fly. You can't. I'm, you know, you can't. Um, it's, you know, we'll have to cancel it. I said, we're not canceling it. Anyway, during that morning, the pain subsided. Uh, and I can tell you, I haven't had any since. Now, and this, I gather, is different than the occasion when there were the three marks on your arm. Yep, separate, yep. So we're talking about at least three different examples. Yeah, three different examples, yeah. In, in each of these examples, you apparently were aboard a, uh, a craft of some sort in a large room where alien beings were performing operations on you of a beneficial nature. Yeah. And I don't normally tell people because they <laughs> think about the doctors know, um, you know, Dr. Kurt, who saw the marks on my arm, the marks on my arm correlated to the diaphragm operation so that was prior to going to the hospital and and being told it's already done yeah um uh, and uh, and i did talk to him afterwards because he said why didn't you say you'd been because they get a, you get a letter, nasty letter <laughs> to the doctors as well uh, and i said i, I said I, I told you i said all i had was those marks on my arm and a weird dream I said, and they're saying the operation's done. And they absolutely were adamant it can't do itself. They explained to me the whole thing about it can't heal itself because it's always moving. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I have not been to a hospital and had an operation. And uh, mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell Dr. Jane anything about aliens. Yeah. Well, and it's bad if they know I do weird things anyway. Christopher, I have a, the impression that we've maybe covered oh, half of the highlights of, of your career, that there's a lot more to explore. So I, I think we ought to do yet another interview and see if we can begin to probe the relationship between your, your contact with these deceased police officers who have been helping you in dreams and, and the alien contact. That relationship between aliens in the afterlife is, is one that uh, I've experienced, and I think uh, it's worth probing further. Yeah, I'm happy to do any more interview that or any more interviews, or one or two, if you wanted to do them. Um, it's, I mean, I know 
that certain things were real. You know, laying on the operating toll table and being told it's already done, that was real. Yeah. You know, was I really in a ship? I don't know. But it certainly sure as hell felt that that's what was happening. Same mm -hmm. with the heart, you know, twice. Yeah. Same with that. I mean, and there's so many other things as well. You know, it's it's very difficult to sometimes get your head around how is this possible? Well, I have to turn around and say so many people I've worked with have witnessed it. It is possible. It does happen. Uh, and if people don't like it, you know, really, it's their loss, I think, that they're not prepared to open their eyes to it. Well, it's my hope that we can, uh, through the course of these interviews, really bring out the fullness of your story, because it's a story, in my opinion, that is worth being told uh, in, in all of its detail. Okay, I'm very happy. Uh, and yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for being with me today. And I look forward to our future conversations. And I want to thank you, too. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.